food and water move across large distances in plants. However, in plants, the movement of food and water also takes place across short distances. That is, within a cell or from one cell to another. This movement of food and water across short distances takes place either passively by diffusion or by active transport. In diffusion, the molecules move in a random manner, generally moving from a region of high concentration to lower concentration. Diffusion is a passive process. It requires no expenditure of energy. It is a slow process, independent of a living system, and can take place in all states, liquid, solid, and gaseous. Did you know that diffusion is the only means of gaseous transport in plants? Gases such as oxygen and carbon dioxide enter and exit stomata via diffusion. The rate of diffusion is affected by several factors such as the size of molecules, their solubility in lipids and the concentration gradient. Of these three factors, the concentration gradient is a must for diffusion to even take place. As for size, the bigger the molecules, the slower the rate of diffusion. And since all membranes are made up of lipids, lipid-soluble substances diffuse faster. For this same reason, hydrophilic or water-soluble substances find it difficult to diffuse through membranes. In addition to their existing concentration gradient, Diffusion of such hydrophilic substances has to be facilitated by special proteins called transport proteins. This type of diffusion, facilitated by proteins without any energy expenditure, is referred to as facilitated transport. The rate of transport in facilitated diffusion is maximum when all transport proteins are used or saturated. Facilitated diffusion has an advantage in that it allows cells to select substances for diffusion. It is however sensitive to inhibitor molecules that react with side chains of the transport proteins. Proteins are responsible for creating channels in the membrane, which allows molecules to pass through them. Some of these channels are large enough to allow a variety of molecules to cross over. Some of these channels are always open, while others are controlled. Some transport proteins, called porins, form pores in the outer membranes of cell organelles, such as plastids or mitochondria, to allow molecules of the size of small proteins to pass through. When a molecule binds itself to a porin, it rotates to release the molecules inside the cell. The water channels are made up of eight different kinds of aquaporins. Some transport proteins allow diffusion if two different types of molecules are required to be transported. Based on direction, transport of molecules can be differentiated into three types. Symport, Antiport, and Uniport. Both molecules cross the membrane in the same direction in a symport, while they move in opposite directions in an antiport. In uniport, as the name suggests, a single molecule diffuses across a membrane independent of other molecules. Unlike diffusion, Active transport requires energy to move molecules against the concentration gradient. It is carried out by membrane proteins that use energy. These proteins, called pumps, 
can also transport substances from low concentration to high concentration, which is taken to uphill transport. Just like facilitated diffusion, the active transport rate is maximum when all protein transporters are being used or saturated. Also, these proteins are specific to the type of substances they carry across. They are sensitive to inhibitors that react with their protein side chains. Of all the means of transport discussed, both diffusion and facilitated diffusion always take place along a concentration gradient and without the expenditure of any energy. Whereas only active transport uses energy. Plants need to be watered. However, have you ever wondered how seeds absorb water in the first place? Seeds absorb water by a special type of diffusion called imbibition, where solids absorb water causing an increase in their volume. Imbibition is a special type of diffusion where, once again, water movement is along a concentration gradient. For any solid to imbibe a liquid, it must have an affinity for the liquid. Also, the water potential gradient between the absorbent, that is the solid, and the liquid imbibed is essential for imbibition. The water potential gradient comprises two main components, solute potential and pressure potential. To understand the concept of water potential, we must take into account that water molecules possess kinetic energy. They are in rapid and constant motion in both liquid and gaseous form. The greater the concentration of water, the greater its kinetic energy. As a result, it has greater water potential. Water potential is denoted by the Greek symbol psi. It is expressed in pressure units as pascal or Pa. The water potential of pure water at standard temperature and pressure is taken as zero. If a solute is dissolved in pure water, the solution has fewer free water molecules. This decreases its water concentration, resulting in decreased water potential. Therefore, we can easily conclude that pure water has the greatest possible water potential, whereas the water potential of all solutions is less than that of pure water. The magnitude of the lowering of water potential due to the addition of solutes is called solute potential. Solute potential is represented by the letter psi s and it is always negative. Solute potential becomes increasingly negative with the addition of solutes. When two solutions come into contact, Water molecules from the system with higher energy will move to the one with lower energy. That is, movement will take place from the solution with higher water potential to the one with lower water potential. For a solution at atmospheric pressure, its water potential is equal to its solute potential. But if pressure greater than atmospheric pressure is applied to pure water or a solution, it results in an increase in water potential. When water enters a plant cell due to diffusion, it builds up pressure against the cell wall, causing the cell to become turgid. 
This pressure that is applied by the protoplasm against the cell wall is called pressure potential. Pressure potential, which is denoted by psi p, is usually positive. However, negative pressure potential is critical to water transport up the stem via xylem cells. Hence it can be stated that the water potential of a cell is a combination of its solute potential and pressure potential. A plant cell is bounded by a cell wall and a cell membrane. It also contains a large central vacuole. This vacuole contains a vacuolar sap that contributes to the solute potential of the plant cell. While the cell wall is freely permeable to water and other substances, allowing them free movement, the cell membrane on the other hand is a semi-permeable membrane. The cell membrane, together with the vacuolar membrane, which is also called tonoplast, determines the movement of molecules in and out of the plant cell. The diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane like the cell membrane is referred to as osmosis. Osmosis occurs spontaneously in response to a driving force. The net direction and rate of osmosis depend on two factors, concentration gradient and pressure gradient. If two solutions are put into a chamber separated by a semi-permeable membrane, then water will move from the region of higher chemical potential or concentration gradient to the region of lower chemical potential until equilibrium is reached. At equilibrium, both chambers will have the same water potential. Also, the potential of water molecules to move from a hypotonic solution to a hypertonic solution across a semi-permeable membrane is called osmotic potential. A hypotonic solution is a solution that has more water and less solutes, whereas a hypertonic solution is one that has less water and more solutes. Let us consider another example of osmosis. A solution of sucrose in water is put into a funnel and separated from the pure water in a beaker by a semi-permeable membrane. The water being hypotonic will move from the beaker to the funnel containing the hypertonic sugar solution, raising the solution level in the funnel. This water movement will continue till both solutions in the funnel and beaker achieve equilibrium. Now we can apply external pressure to the upper part of the funnel so that no water diffuses from beaker to funnel through the membrane. This external pressure required to prevent the water from diffusing is known as osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is a function of solute concentration. The higher the solute concentration, the more is the diffusion of water. Therefore, more osmotic pressure will be required to stop the entry of water molecules into the solution. The water potential is equal to its solute potential for a solution that is at atmospheric pressure. Unlike osmotic potential, which is negative, osmotic pressure is a positive pressure. However, numerically, Osmotic pressure is equal to osmotic potential, only their signs differ. Osmosis, therefore, plays an important role in water movement in the plant cell. Movement of water in and out of a plant cell is essential to a plant's existence. The plant cell wall can either shrink or become turgid in response to the movement of water. It is the surrounding solution of the cell that decides the direction in which water flows. 
The surrounding solution can be categorized into three types. Isotonic, Hypotonic and Hypertonic. When the concentration of the external solution is the same as that of the cell cytoplasm, the solution is said to be isotonic. Such a solution balances the osmotic pressure of the cell cytoplasm. If the concentration of the external solution is lower than that of the cytoplasm, it is said to be hypotonic. On the other hand, if the external solution is more concentrated, that is, it has more solutes, it is said to be hypertonic. If a plant cell is placed in a hypertonic solution, water moves out of the cell due to osmosis. The cell membrane shrinks away from the cell wall with this outward movement of water. This phenomenon is called plasmolysis, while the cell is said to be plasmalized. In plasmolysis, water first moves out of the cytoplasm and then the vacuole. This movement of water takes place from a cell which has higher water potential to an area outside the cell that has lower water potential. However, plasmolysis is a reversible process. When plasmalized cells are placed in a hypotonic solution, that is, a solution with less solutes and higher water potential, water moves from the solution into the cell. This causes the cytoplasm to build a pressure against the cell wall. This pressure is called turgor pressure. This turgor pressure exerted by the protoplast against the cell wall due to the entry of water is called pressure potential Psi-P. It is the turgor pressure in the plant cells that helps a plant to be erect. Since plant cells have a rigid cell wall, the cell does not rupture despite the turgor pressure. However, the cell enlarges and results in the extension growth. Now if this plasmalized cell is placed in an isotonic solution, instead of a hypertonic or hypotonic solution, there is no net flow of water from either inside or outside the cell. When the flow of water from and into the cell is in equilibrium, the cell is said to be in a flaccid state. Flaccid cells are found in a wilted plant that has not been watered for a long time. Therefore, it can be said that the surrounding external solution decides the behavior of the cell. Have you ever wondered what happens when we put a twig of white flowers in colored water? The white flowers gradually begin to color. After some time, Examine the cut end of the twig. You will spot the colored region through which water was transported inside the twig. This colored region belongs to xylem cells in vascular bundles through which water is transported in plants. Substances often need to be transported across both short and long distances inside plants. Sometimes, the site of production of food or absorption of water may be quite far from the plant's storage organs. In such cases, means of transport such as diffusion and cytoplasmic streaming, supplemented by active transport, do not suffice. They can only account for short distance movements in plants. Moreover, Diffusion is a painfully slow process which might take years to transport substances over a distance of one meter in plant. Therefore, a special long distance transport system called a mass or bulk flow system exists in plants to transport water, minerals and food. This system transfers minerals and food at a faster rate than diffusion. As the name suggests, the mass flow system is a process that moves substances in bulk. 
It arises out of a pressure difference between two points. Irrespective of the state substances are in, either in solution or in suspension, they move along at the same pace like in a flowing river. Bulk flow is achieved through either a positive hydrostatic gradient like that caused by a garden hose or through negative hydrostatic pressure which can, for example, be caused by suction through a straw. This bulk flow system conducted through the plant's vascular tissues, xylem and phloem, is referred to as translocation. Xylem transports water, minerals and hormones upwards from the plant's roots, while phloem transfers organic or inorganic solutes from the leaves to other parts of the plant. To conclude, the bulk flow system differs from diffusion in three ways. First, it transports substances across long distances in plants, unlike diffusion. Second, unlike diffusion in which substances move independently, the bulk flow system moves all substances at the same pace. Third, diffusion depends on a concentration gradient while the bulk flow system is achieved through a positive or negative hydrostatic gradient. Therefore, long distance travel in plants is carried out by a bulk flow system in the plant's vascular bundles, consisting of xylem and phloem.